Good morning, y'all. It's good to see you this 
morning. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing hymn number seven, Joyful, Joyful, We Need Worthy. smells like meatballs for a reason. <laughs> I was telling you later on in the week, even today as you walk by, yep, I'm cooking a big old crock pot of meatballs. Because lunch is happening here right after this worship service, right here. We're not going to the pavilion, we're going to stay here. So we do need to stir the furniture around and get all the food out and everything. So please be helpful. Um, if you cannot move furniture or you don't have any idea what to do, if you would scoot out to the commons and wait for a little while, then we'll invite you back in so that we can start to serve the meal. Okay? Sound like a plan? Um, there's a lot going on. If you would please, please, please not leave your bulletin here today. Take it with you because there's um, so many things going on. The Easter missions offering, this is the last day to um, put your offering in the cart and ask it back the, for that or to do it electronically. Um, Youth Converge happens today, 2.30 to 4.30. It is time to launch tribe season with the youth, so um, that's happening over in the community building. This Friday, there is a fun Friday. I already have about 10 kids signed up, so we will be having this one. If you want your child to be involved, please see the registration table out there and get their name on um, a form for me, please. That's from 5.30 to 7.30 this Friday. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. We will be... Um, Dedicating four children from three families um, during that service, so come and enjoy that as well. Something kind of special we try to do on Mother's Day. This Tuesday, our broadest classics are going to Golden Corral. So far, I haven't seen anyone who needs to ride in the van, but if you're going, I need to know you're going so we can have a space big enough for us to eat together and kind of let them know the herd is arriving. So if you will, please get your name on the list and just let us know whether you need to ride in the van or not. That's it. Um, you can ride in the van, 11 o'clock here, otherwise 11.30 at Golden Corral over on Gaskins Road. And bring about $15 with you if you're going to tip. Got it? And you should. Just say it. They do a great job over there. Um, also in the back of the chair pockets are red cards to sign up for the connection meal. I think we have till Wednesday to do that. So pull one of those out and um, put that in the offering bag as well. How about we go to the Lord in prayer? I feel like I need to take a breath. Slow down just a little bit. <coughs> Father, we do thank you so much that we are a busy people. We've got lots going on. We have great ways to plug in. Wonderful opportunities for fellowship, for missions, and all kinds of things. We just thank you for the blessing of things like our yard sale, um, which missions will benefit so much. We do offer um, our offerings for Easter missions as well. Um, help us to be of service wherever you have placed us. And Lord, we just know that you can do that and you will do that. And our testimonies can speak to that. Father, we love you. We ask your blessing on this time together. 
as we worship you with our whole hearts and we look for ways that we can change to be more like your son Jesus. In whose name I pray. Good morning, Broadus family. I'd like to invite you to stand one more time with us and sing the Lord's Prayer.
sooner or later it's going to go away. And that's God helping you to heal, to heal from being bitter. And so I'm thankful. You know, God created us. He created our emotions and our hearts. And he knows that it's hard for us just to say, oh, y'all mad at someone, but I'm going to turn that off. So he teaches us to learn to be loving and kind and to learn to be forgiving. And you know what happens? If someone does something bad to you and you are kind to them, you've forgiven them in your heart, it usually turns around that they kind of become kind to you too. That they see that you're, you're not mad, that you don't want to hurt them, and it helps them to become your friend again. So I pray that we will kind of learn what Jesus teaches us about forgiveness, how important it is, and you can't do it just once. Especially if you have a brother or a sister or something, guess what? You're going to be forgiving each other all your lives, and you just have to keep on doing it. You get married, you just keep on forgiving, and that's what Jesus teaches, because that way the relationship can be sweet and, and can last forever. All right. All right, let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that that young lady, Corey, she grew up and she learned how to let go of, of her bitterness and to truly forgive people in her heart, and it made her a happier person. And I pray that you would help us learn to forgive others and to realize that you have forgiven us. We've all done bad things, and yet you forgive us and you help us to do better. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for coming up with me. Good morning. I'll be reading Matthew 18, 21 through 35, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As they began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children, and all that he had, would be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his own servants, who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I shall pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went to their, told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled that debt of yours just because you begged me for it. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just like I, as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart.
I never preach on Joseph without being reminded of this very fitting description that was penned by Rudyard Kipling, the poet, in his poem, If. Some of you know this poem very well. But he says, and of course it's written from the masculine point of view, like a father talking to his son, but it works uh, for women and girls as well. But he said, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, yet don't look too good nor talk too wise, if you can dream and not make dream your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Wow, how descriptive. We could take a part of that poem, worked it in all through our series about Joseph, the son of Jacob. Now, we're going to recap the story for any of you who are kind of new to us. But what I've done in, in four sermons, I'm going to do it in about one minute. So, the recap is this. Joseph, the son of Jacob, was pampered by his dad. He was hated by his brothers. He was given dreams by God. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, and yet he distinguished himself in the household of Potiphar, the captain of the guard. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he was sent to prison. And yet, even in prison, he distinguished himself. God was with him and gave him the wisdom to accurately interpret the cupbearer's and the baker's dreams. Then after two more years in prison, he was called on to discern the meaning of the Pharaoh's dreams. Dreams about an impending famine. Because of his wisdom, he was set free. He was promoted to a high place of authority and put in charge of preparing all Egypt for the coming famine. He went about in his new robes and his new chariot to supervise the building of barns and the collection of grain through seven years of great abundance. And when the seven years of abundance ended, the famine set in. Well, the end of chapter 41, we read these verses last week. But chapter 41 and verse 55, it says, When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. And when the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold the grain to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. Because the famine was severe in all the world. Well, that brings us to the new material as we wrap up this, this series on Joseph. And it's here in chapter, as we get to verse, or chapter 42 and following, that we discover God's plan for Joseph <coughs> was not just to save the Egyptians, but rather uh, to save even his own family, God's chosen people, sometimes called the Hebrews the children of Israel. As the grain ran out in the land of Canaan, Joseph's previous home, Joseph's elderly father, Jacob, also known as Israel, he took steps to save his family, to save the clan. 
And he said to his ten older sons, and we find this in chapter 42, verse 2, he said, I have heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we will live and not die. Now, notably, he did not send his youngest son, Benjamin, down to Egypt. Because Benjamin was the only son he had left of his favorite wife, Rachel. And Benjamin, of course, being the younger brother to Joseph. And so it was that the declaration of Pharaoh, saying that everyone who needed food needed to appear before Joseph, it set up a most interesting situation. The same ten men who had about 20 years earlier, contemplated killing their younger brother, but ended up sell, selling him into slavery, they found themselves bowing before him, begging for food for their family. Joseph, of course, recognized his brothers. Well, they came in a group of 10. They can't have been that hard. They didn't change that much in, in 20 years. Well, there they were. They were speaking the Hebrew language, which he would, of course, recognize as his native uh, tongue. And I'm just going to tell you that I believe Joseph had been expecting them. I think he's seen God's hand at work all along the way. They, on the other hand, do not recognize him. One, they weren't expecting him. They figured Joseph was long gone, long dead, probably. And also... He would have changed a lot. He was just a 17-year-old young man when they sold him into slavery. And so now you know, he's a full grown-up. He's dressed like an Egyptian, I assume. He probably got the makeup and the headdress and everything. And he's speaking a different language. So they don't know who he is. So Joseph had a decision to make. This young slave turned governor now had the power to do whatever he wanted to with those scoundrels. I wonder if those old feelings of anger and bitterness began to, to rise up in his heart. They couldn't laugh at him now like they did when he was younger. They couldn't push him around. They couldn't speak disrespectfully to him. He had them right where he wanted them. Right where the dream said that they would be so long ago, bowing before him. So what would he do? He first of all talked to them. He asked them where they were from. And they said, well, we're from the land of Canaan. We have come in order to buy food. And then, strangely, he accused them of being spies. No, you've come to Egypt to, to check out Egypt during our time of weakness, during the famine. And they, they answered in this way. They said, we are honest men, not spies. Your servants were 12 brothers, the sons, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph insisted that they must be spies and that they would be put to a test. And so he kept them in prison for three days. And he told them that he was going to allow them to go home with grain to feed the family. But one brother was going to be kept behind in Egypt. There would be no more grain. And Simeon, the second oldest of the, of the sons, uh, he would remain in Egypt until they return and they have their younger brother Benjamin with them. The brothers, of course, were upset by this, but they had no choice. And as they spoke to each other in their native tongue, not knowing that Joseph could understand them, they speculated that God was judging them for their sin against Joseph. And I suppose they began to speculate that they might share Joseph's own fate that they might themselves might be made prisoners in Egypt. Oh, the irony. For Joseph, the test was not to see if they were spies. He knew that they weren't. But to see if their hearts had changed after all those years. Would they abandon Simeon as quickly as they abandoned him when they sold him into slavery? 
Joseph also knew that God's plan was for Benjamin to come to him in Egypt. Since the dream in the time of his youth had specifically shown all 11 of his brothers bowing in his presence. Well, the brothers did go home reluctantly. They went home without Simeon. It was the only way they could save their father and their families from starvation. Each had a sack of grain that they had purchased while in Egypt. But when along the journey they opened their sacks of grain, what do they find in it but the money they had paid with? This made no sense. And it scared them, not understanding why after they had, had given the money for the grain, it had gotten its way back into their, uh, in their bags of grain. So they got home and they told their father what had happened. Simeon was still being held in Egypt, and there would be no more grain until they appeared before that stern Egyptian governor with Benjamin present. But Jacob said, no. For the first time, Jacob hinted at some knowledge about the fate of his favorite son. When he says to the, the boys, he says, you've deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. For some time they could not change Jacob's mind. Not until the grain was gone and the family was on the brink of starvation again. And Judah personally guaranteed Benjamin safety, safety and, and was willing to bear any punishment, any blame, if something were to happen to Benjamin. But he said, but we've got to go. So finally, Jacob relented, and he gave them this plan. And we find this in, in chapter uh, 43, starting at verse 11. It says, Then their father Israel, remember Jacob, said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags, and take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm, a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was put back into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and go back to the man at once, and may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, so that he will let your other brother and Benjamin come back with you. As for me, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. When they arrived back in Egypt, Joseph set up a, a more personal encounter with this group of brothers. And it frightened them that they were taken to Joseph's uh, private residence, but they were treated well. And they were reunited with Simeon there. And then when Joseph arrived, they all bowed down to him. And so the first dream from Joseph's youth, it was fulfilled. At dinner, Joseph asked for details about the welfare of their father. And when he saw Benjamin, his full-blood younger brother, the one <coughs> who had not hated him, he rushed away in the house to weep so that they wouldn't see his emotions. At dinner, they were all fed plenty, but Benjamin was given extra. Perhaps his extra portion was to see if the brothers were still prone to the same kind of petty jealousy they had had earlier. The next day, Joseph honored his word, and they were all sent home together, carrying more sacks of grain. But Joseph had one more test for them. Along the road, Joseph's Egyptian servants caught up and detained them. And they gave the accusation <coughs> that one of them must have stolen Joseph's silver cup there from his house. Now, such a thing would have been the further, furthest thing from their minds. And they declared if any one of them was guilty of that, that person should die and the rest of them would become slaves in Egypt. Joseph's men said, no, just the guilty one will be taken. And 
And so it is that they began to search the sacks. And lo and behold, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, just as it had been planted there. You begin to see how the hearts of the brothers have changed. Instead of surrendering Benjamin, they all returned to face that stern governor back in Egypt. Joseph told them that they were all free to go except the one with the silver cup in his sack, Benjamin. But Judah, who had given his father his word to protect Benjamin, fell down before Joseph. And he told him the sorrow that it was going to cause their father. And then the man Judah, who 20 years earlier had bound his brother and sold him into slavery. He said this, and we read the words from there from chapter 44. Sorry, I'm looking for uh, chapter 44, verses, verses 33 and 34. He says, now then, please let your servant remain here. He's, Judah saying, let me stay with you as a slave rather than Benjamin in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brother. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that that would come upon my father. That was all Joseph could take. He burst into tears, and he confessed to them who he was. And we find that then in the, in the next chapter, in 45, verse 4, it says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here but God. He made me father to Pharaoh. Lord of his entire household and the ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me the Lord of all Egypt. Come down here, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and shall be near me, you and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. And then down in verse 14 it says, Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Those same brothers later in the story, come to Joseph and say to him, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. They're basically saying, please forgive our sins. They are still afraid that Joseph might take his vengeance upon them. But Joseph responded this way in chapter 50. He said, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide, provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. You know, we've looked at God's plan for, for working out in the life of Joseph, what God wanted to do. How God was with him through the hard times and the good times. How God used him for his divine and merciful purpose. And now we get to see the power that God has given to forgiveness. You see, God knew from the very beginning 
that when working with selfish, immature, hot-headed, and imperfect people, there would have to be a provision for forgiveness. And folks, I'm not just talking about those ten brothers. I'm talking about all of us, ever. And if there wasn't some provision for forgiveness, all would be lost. No guilt could ever be released. No second chances would ever be given. No relationship would survive, and no broken relationship could ever be healed if it's not for forgiveness. So God took from his own character, and he built within us the capacity both for repentance and for forgiveness. He put that capacity in the heart of every man, every woman, every girl, every boy. Now, I want to mention to you just briefly this morning what forgiveness is not or what it does not do. First of all, forgiveness does not indicate weakness on the part of the forgiver. Rather, it indicates strength. To set aside one's rights, I have a right to get revenge, but to set that aside, that shows incredible maturity. It shows strength of character. It shows so much more than petty retaliation does. Also, forgiveness does not condone or minimize the sin that has been committed or the hurt that it has caused. Remember that the great thing about forgiveness is not that it overlooks sin. It's not that it says, oh, it doesn't matter. The great thing about forgiveness is its power to overcome sin. Also, forgiveness does not remove all the consequences of sin. There are sometimes legal consequences. There are sometimes natural consequences. What forgiveness does, though, is to, is to say, for, for our part, personally, we're not looking to hurt the other person. We're looking to help them. But then also you need to know that forgiveness doesn't immediately wash away all the hurt and the pain. But it does allow for that healing process, for that bell that gets <coughs> lighter and lighter in its sound. It allows that healing process to take place. I know that we talk a lot about, oh, to forgive and forget. And I'm just going to tell you, I don't know that that's even possible in all cases. You can't just make up your mind you're going to forget something and it disappears. So forgetting isn't always possible. But guess what? Forgiving actually is. Not easy, but it's possible. So what does forgiveness do? Forgiveness has the power to break the cycle of retaliation. In that musical Fiddler on the Roof, somebody cries out in their anger, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And the wise old milkman says, very good, that way we'll all be blind and toothless. <laughs> That's where the cycle of retaliation leads. But it doesn't have to be that way. Also, forgiveness opens up the door for reconciliation. It means that two people I can set aside whatever it is that broke the relationship and can redevelop a lasting relationship, a friendship, whether it's a friendship situation or it's in a, in, in a marriage or in a workplace, wherever it is. Also, forgiveness allows you to live in the present rather than the past. Your thoughts of, of, of bitterness towards someone, that's related to something that's happened in the past. You need to live for what the future is. Where is the happiness there? What changes for the good can take place? Forgiveness lets you live in the present and live for the future. And forgiveness also lets a human heart reflect the character of God. Going back to Jacob, the dad. Uh, there was a time earlier in his life, of course, that his brother Esau hated him very much and was very bitter against him. But then years later, they, 
they had a, a reunion, that they got back together, and poor Jacob was scared to death of the way his brother Esau was going to treat him, that he might try to get his revenge. But when they got together, instead, what Jacob found is that Esau treated him kindly and, and, and forgave him of the past things that had, had happened. And then Jacob says a very curious thing to this old fellow with his big red beard. If you know the story of, of Jacob and Esau, he says, For to see your face is to see the face of God. What he meant was, I've been forgiven by you, and I've been forgiven by God. There is some similarity there. I wonder if the Apostle Paul thought at all of Joseph when he wrote this to the, the Christians in, in Colossae. And this is Colossians 3.13 where he says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Well, you probably know the rest of the story about Joseph. The brothers went home with food and gifts and they were actually able to convince their father that at long, after all that time, Joseph was still alive. And so Jacob reunited with his son down in Egypt. The whole clan moved to the area of Goshen there, and, and they lived for many years as honored guests. Because Joseph's heart was forgiving, the Hebrews didn't starve. And because the brothers' hearts were changed, they were able to be a family again. This was God's plan all along. And so this morning, I want you to consider more than Joseph's story, I want you to consider your story. Who do you need to forgive today? What bitterness have you been holding onto that you need to let go of? In what relationship do you need to take the initiative toward reconciliation? Remember, forgiveness has great power. But also, whose forgiveness do you need to seek? What wrong do you need to repent of? It's the way that we as sinners open the, that door of healing. And I hope you understand that we all need God's forgiveness. And he made the first move when he gave his son Jesus to be the sacrifice for our sins. If you haven't done it, I urge you to accept that gift. And then may the, the mercy and the grace of God's character fill your heart, making you a conduit of his grace towards others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I dare say all of us struggle in some areas with forgiveness. We struggle with those who have, have hurt us or those who have hurt our families or, or, or those who have been dishonest with us. And, and it's hard to let go of that sometimes. But Heavenly Father, what it means is that for our part, we're willing to let that go. We're willing to show love instead of hatred. We're willing to, to be kind instead of trying to get revenge. And so, Lord, I just pray that your character could flow through our lives. And that through your power we can find reconciliation. We can find uh, new and stronger friendships. We can fix things that have maybe been broken a long, long time. We can't do it, Lord, without you because it's really not a human thing. It's a divine thing. Plant your forgiveness in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing as our time of response to him, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. And as we sing, this is a time for us to respond to God. But as I ask you the question, you need to be thinking, what is God calling you to do in your relationship with him and in your relationship uh, with others. And if you have something on your heart that you want to share with me, um,
particularly. I'll be here at the front. You're welcome to come uh, speak with me while the congregation is singing. But you also see that we have the Lord's Supper before us. In just a, a few moments, it's going to be passed to you and put into your hands. And that will be a great moment of reflection for us as we remember what Jesus has done for us. So let this hymn be a preparation for that as well. Let's stand and sing together. Jesus with his disciples in the upper room. We think about the, the depth of meaning that was put on the bread and the cup that was passed to them. 
that they would remember the sacrifice made uh, on their behalf, and it's the same as has been made on our behalf, that you would die for us that we might live, that we might be counted as holy in your presence. And so, Lord, we, we come with thanksgiving, and we come asking that you, you help these lessons uh, to mature in our hearts so that we can be like Jesus to those who are around us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup, and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Each of you, take this and drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes. 
to give. As we go today, let's stand and sing together the bond of love. Yeah. 